Okay. All right. So this lecture is on epigenetics. So just to recap, we have our central DNA dogma where we go from DNA to RNA to proteins. And sometimes changes in the DNA can um, result in the same amino acids uh, coded in our final protein. So it's harmless. But sometimes we know that mutations can change the amino acid, which could potentially change the function of our protein. Well, it's a little bit more complex than that. Sometimes changes don't always involve the DNA sequence. And so when it doesn't involve the DNA sequence, it's called epigenetics. All right, so epigenetics is the study of cellular and physiological traits that are not heritable by daughter cells and are not caused by changes in the DNA sequence. So in other words, um, it's other causes that change gene expression or cellular phenotype. So epi means meaning over, above, or outside. Here's an analogy for epigenetics. Let's say that your life is a very, very, very long movie. You have cells, which are your actors and actresses. Your DNA is the script. You have a DNA sequence, which means words, key actions, events. Concepts of genetics would be like screenwriting. Now, epigenetics would be like directing. You have the same script, but the director can choose which scenes to add or delete. He can alter dialogue and make the better, uh, movie better or worse, like George Lucas versus J.J. Abrams in the new Star Wars movie. And I just want to no uh, note that you know, every single cell inside of your, of your body, over 100 trillion cells, they all have the same DNA, yet you have cells that perform different functions. So that means certain genes are being expressed while other genes are being repressed. So, so the objectives for today, we're going to discuss how epigenetic marks can happen. We'll look at how DNA is packed. We'll look at how DNA can be modified. We'll talk about methylation of histone proteins, um, how things can be inherited from generation to generation. And then some world, real world life examples of epigenetics and some of the health risks that are involved. What? Did I? Whoops, yes, heat risks. Thank you. So a cell expresses only a small fraction of its genes. It's estimated between 3 to 5% of the genes at a given time. And enzymes must locate the right genes at the right time. But when a cell can't, obviously some serious imbalances can occur as well as some diseases. Okay, I'm going to explain this diagram. Um, this box represents the nucleus. I know, it's boxy. I'm sorry. So here we have our chromatin, which is DNA um, plus proteins. And then it, you know, spins, or sorry, coils into our DNA. And there are genes located on our DNA. Um, and the genes get translated into RNA. And notice that these yellows are removed. So what are those? Introns. Introns. Exons are expressed, so here's my final mRNA, and then my mRNA leaves the nucleus to go to the uh, cytoplasm, where it gets translated into a polypeptide, and then once it's done its function, it gets degraded and recycled. So here's my polypeptide, it folds into a nice protein, and then the protein at the end of its life cycle gets degraded. This is basically a nice little cycle here. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. This is like what we've been covering since chapter 14. Okay. Okay. Now, these bolded words off to the side are processes that we have discussed or will discuss in today's lecture. So today we're going to talk about DNA methylation and histone acetylation, which happens in this stage. Um, we have talked about transcription. We have talked about RNA processing. Um, we've talked about how mRNA needs a certain kind of biochemical code in order to leave um, the nucleus, so transport it to the cytoplasm. We've talked about translation, um, how proteins can be modified how they get transported to certain parts of the cell, and then yesterday we talked, or actually just five minutes ago, how proteins are degraded. So we're going to spend some time up here. So chromatin modification. So first one I want to talk about is DNA methylation, which is the addition of CH3 molecules. And it's usually attached to the cytosine or acytosine inside the DNA molecule. It's attached to the side, so it doesn't interfere with the hydrogen bonds, because we don't want our bonds to break apart. But it can still be recognized by proteins. And so what happens is we have a cluster of um, meth, um, meth, methyl groups attached to the cytosine, and um, it activates you know, certain proteins to bind to it. Methylation turns genes off. So we call this a gene silencing, which I've cut off here. I'm sorry. So a diagram to depict this, here I have my DNA spiral staircase, and you can see there are methyl groups C, and then there's three hydrogens on it attached to the cytosine. And as a result, it's going to co um, 
cause my DNA to become more compact. So the gene is shut off. Now histones, remember, DNA wraps around histones to become, you know, even more super condensed. Histones can also be methylated, so we're going to add some CH3 groups to it. But when histones are methylated, um, they, genes are actually, uh, they, they're inactive. So methylation turns things off. Now, how histones can help turn genes on is through histone acetylation, which means we're going to add an acetyl group. So this is an acetyl group. Oof. Acetyl groups are associated with active regions. And how it helps make the, the chromatin slash DNA active and inactive is by um, kind of unfolding the DNA or uncondensing and condensing. So I think on this next slide here. So if you condense it, it's unactive. And if you like, uncondense it, it's opia. Oh, then it's active. Yep. Okay, so in this diagram here, I have methyl groups attached to my histone. And notice my DNA is super coil tight, so nothing can get in there and read genes. Okay? But when I add um, when I add acetyl groups, which are denoted here, my DNA spreads out. And the reason for that is because acetyl groups have a different charge, and so it kind of interacts with that positive negative charge that histones have with DNA. So a closer look at histone acetylation. How we add on acetyl groups is through an enzyme called histone acetyl transferases, or HATS. And I guarantee you this slide is on your exam. It's a short answer. I think, it says, I think it says something like, um, how do HATS and HDACs uh, affect DNA, or something like that. How do they turn on? And you have to go a little bit more in depth with it. Okay, so... Histone acetyltransferases, or HATs, affect the chromatin structure because they turn on transcription. We have this acetyl group um, that leaves, uh, it sorry, it decreases the positive charges, so it kind of interferes with this opposites attract between hist histones and DNA. Um, so that's acetyltransferases. It's going to turn on transcription. There are enzymes called histone deacetylases, which means we want to shut off genes. And these are called HDACs. What they re do is they just remove the acetyl groups. So on this diagram here, I have chromatin that's super condensed. I add some HATS enzymes. And look, now my DNA is a little bit more spread out, so proteins can get in there. Or sorry, RNA polymerases can get in there and read some genes. But then maybe I don't want that gene expressed anymore, so here comes some HDACs. Remove those acetyl groups. Now my um, chromatin is condensed again. And the cycle repeats itself. So... Is this of like a strand of DNA that it's trying yeah, to Yeah, this, okay, so this purple thing, that's my DNA wrapped around the green globs. The green globs are my histones. And that makes chromatin. Mm -hmm, yeah, this whole thing is chromatin. So it's, okay. Okay, can I move on? All right, RNAs, once RNAs are made, can also interact with epigenetic marks. There are some non-coding mRNAs that get made, and what they do is they um, interact with the DNA and the histones. Sometimes they just kind of sit on DNA and histones. I'm going to close the door real quick here. These non-coding RNAs, um, when they're made, they do not get translated into proteins. That's why they're called non-coding RNAs. But they do regulate gene expression at the transcription level. So. Important mm -hmm. notes, methylation and acetylation are non-sequence DNA mm -hmm. modifications. They do not change the sequence of DNA bases, and they do not change the base pair specifi specificity, which means it doesn't alter the A bonds with T and C bonds with G.
<clears throat> Can I move on? Yeah. Okay, moving on to how epigenetic marks get replicated. So when a cell obviously replicates itself, if there are epigenetic marks on it, it will get copied into the chromosome of the daughter cells. So if there are a lot of epigenetic events early in life, it can alter how cells will behave later on in the organism's life. <clears throat> okay. So methylation can be preserved. Um, we have noticed that it gets passed on to the daughter cells. The daughter cells will have the same methylation pattern as the parent cells. In germ cells, which are egg and sperm, um, pattern of methylation can be passed through gametes to the next generation of offspring. So yes, epigenetic marks can be replicated and passed on generation to generation. Okay, here's an example of an epigenetic silencing, X inactivation. So we have talked about this, how females are XX, and one of the Xs um, gets inactivated. And how it gets actually uh, inactivated uh, is by epigenetic mechanisms, so through DNA methylation and through histone modifications. So this is how one of our female X's get shut off. We have observed X inactivation in calico cats as well, um, in tortoiseshell cats. So we talked about how calico so cats have that. Cat. I have no idea. Andrew, what's a tortoiseshell cat? I have no idea. <laughs> okay. I do most of my work with horses, so oh. I can't say what he has. Tortoise gotcha. shell cat. Looking it up, has bargain? Yeah. Just like the back. I don't know, man. I don't know. Crazy. Okay, there's some <laughs> other effects. <laughs> um, epigenetic regulation inheritance has been linked to cancer, obesity, aging, longevity, long Oh my gosh, another important process. Yes, thank you. Wow. So if in, if in your family um, people live to extremely long, like uh, old age, that's it's most likely that it will be passed on to you. Every other year. Oh. Interesting. Um, epigenome, which is the pattern of that DNA methylation and histone modification, is dynamic. That means that it responds to an environment, but it can also be inherited as well. So I think I have some examples here coming up. Nope, not yet, but there will be. Our cells, they can change the epigenetic patterns during development and aging. So it can determine how cells can specialize, become different cell types. If we are exposed to harmful chemicals, nutrient deficiencies, and other stresses, obviously epigenetic marks will be added in ways that will affect gene activity. I've mentioned this with like two identical twins with the same DNA. And if they were separated at birth and placed in different environments, and then they were to meet back up, let's just say 20 years later, there would be considerable differences between the two. One would be more nourished than the other, and one will probably be taller than the other. Like there are differences, and it's all because of their environment, what they were exposed to. So here's a case study with epigenetic marks and stress. Project Ice Storm in Quebec. Um, there was an ice storm in Quebec back in 1998. And so what they did is they looked at pregnant women during this ice storm. To, and then they also looked at the length of time without electricity. And they were trying to see if they could predict epigenetic profiles. So the women in this uh, ice storm, these pregnant women, they had no electricity for about 45 days. Could you imagine living without electricity? without electricity for 45 days. So just imagine the hardship and the stress that they went through. And then they looked at it, and it was correlated with DNA methylation levels. The children, once they were born, also had unique DNA signatures. Actually, they had higher levels of asthma and autism. I thought they were going to be like superhumans. Yeah, I thought they were going to be beasts. X-Men. <laughs> no. Uh, case study with pollution. So these are like chemicals, jet fuel, even common plastics can induce epigenetic modifications. I've heard you, I'm sure you've heard of like BPA and how it could affect your gametes and all that stuff and yeah. cause cancer. Yeah, it's true. But, um, 
So here, when they occur in reproductive cells, they can be transmitted to later on generations. They've looked at mice exposed to agricultural chemicals, and they've shown that abnormalities are passed on through at least five generations. How long did, like, you know, when you dropped, like, your shin and I was talking, how long did that affect you? Is it still? It's still going on. Like, it's towards the end of it. So it's, like, three generations right now, mm -hmm. like three or four. Yeah. It's pretty terrible. So by the end of five, they'll probably be. Another case study looking at DDT exposure and obesity. So remember, DDT is uh, the chemical that kind of um, get the it's an insect insecticide for mosquitoes. They were spraying it like it was, like it was uh, I don't know, like it was sugar in the 1950s. Like there's videos of a parade and everyone's yeah standing on the sideline and they're cheering and all of a sudden they're getting sprayed in the face with DDT. <laughs> And then, uh, and they're just like totally fine with it. Or like they're in the swimming pool and they're spraying DDT to get rid of the mosquitoes and they're just like happy little children. <laughs> they're just loving it. Yeah. So they've correlated DDT with um, obesity, um, especially through the second generation. So more than half of the fourth generation of grand pups of the mice injected with DDT developed obesity, um, even through the, the second. Oh, what would that you look should like? see a fat mice. It's like. Show us a picture. Okay. I wonder what like what thing will come out when we're like okay. That, like, so pause. What they did is they looked at Americans, and they said the, uh, the obesity rate from the 1950s has increased, and that could be due to other things too. But they're looking at people that were specifically exposed to DDT, and then what they're trying to do is they're trying to replicate it in the lab. So it's a, it's insecticide in it. Oh, uh, I actually I don't I'm not sure what the mechanism is, but obviously it does alter the de the genes that um, probably like affect insulin, yeah, metabolism, and other things like that. Yeah. Okay. So someone wants to see a f obese. Mouse. Mouse. <laughs> Whoa. 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 Right there. Okay. The one compared to this one's trying to eat lettuce. It's on a diet. God. The white, the one compared to the big, like, brown one. one. That is so funny. Oh my god. Yeah. Okay. We got no clue. I would only want an obese mouse. Um, there are other studies as well with humans. Um, like an explosion in a chemical plant in Italy back in 76 exposed residents to dioxin and then they've noticed that their descendants have had long-term health effects so there's okay. other cases oh okay. well might it's, I don't know Depends on how bad it was and the was concentration. Like a lot. Probably then. So go, switching gears to nutrition, some famine um, effects here, and they found this in Sweden. Uh, we have women have um, when we looked at their paternal grandmothers, if they were in a fast famine swing, um, then these women had rates of higher cardiovascular disease. But increased risk was not seen in men, so it only affected women for some reason. But nor women whose maternal grandmother or grandfathers endured a famine. So it was only on the paternal side, which was very, very weird. But the weird thing about it is that same observations have made in descendants of Dutch population during World War II. So it's just, it's kind of weird. Like, no one knows exactly why, but they, they see these correlations. And obviously correlations doesn't always mean causation, but just, just keep that in mind. Grandpa grew up during like the Great Depression and he doesn't like get hungry really. He really? doesn't feel hungry really. Oh. He says because he doesn't eat as much as a child. <laughs> <laughs> so sad. Okay, so the effects on evolution. With all these epigenetic changes going on, uh, it could explain why new species do emerge more often than one would expect. We know that epigenetic changes appear to occur about 1,000 times more frequently. Uh, this might greatly increase the amount of variation in populations for natural selection. So. Epigenetics, yeah, it could lead to new species that are arising. In closing, epigenetics is everywhere. What you eat, where you sleep, who you interact with, uh, when do you go to sleep, how you exercise, even aging, 
can cause those chemical modifications inside um, your DNA and could ultimately turn on and off genes over time. So. Reversible. Yeah. But it is reversible, so it's not all bleak and dark. If we could map every single cause and effect of different combinations, we could reverse the gene states to keep the good while eliminate the bad. So theoretically, we could cure cancer, slow aging, and stop obesity, theoretically. Okay, now there, there are some questions, but before you, you get started on that, there's only five questions. Three of them are multiple choice. I want to show you epigenetics with mice here, real quick. Another fat mouse. Well, it has to deal with stress. Oh, then uh, I'm going to be like that mouse. Remember to see. Okay, where is it? Oh, here it is. Epigenetics. This is, by the way, if you ever have time, you should just Google Utah Genetics. It's the coolest website ever. Um, lick your rats. That's what I want to look. What kind of mother are you? Okay, so it says some mother rats spend a lot of time licking, grooming, and nursing their pups. Others seem to ignore their pups. Highly nurtured rat pups tend to grow up to be calm adults, while rat pups who receive little nurturing tend to grow up to be anxious. It turns out the difference between a calm and an anxious rat is not genetic, it's epigenetic. The nurturing behavior of the mother rat during the first week of life shapes her pup's epigenomes. And the epigenetic pattern that mom established tends to stay put even after the pup becomes adult. Oh, I hope this loads faster because this is the funniest thing ever. Here we go. What kind of mother are you? Lick a pup Deep rat. in the brain of a newborn rat pup, methyl molecules, green, silence the GR gene. When it's active, the GR gene produces a protein that helps the body relax after a stressful event. The type of care a pup receives from its mother during the first week of life can change the expression of this gene. Okay, so then I click start, because now I'm the rat mom. Oh my God. <laughs> Wow, you're an attentive rat mother. It's surprising your pup has any fur left on its body. Your licking and grooming has seriously activated your pup's GR gene. Your pup will have an easy time relaxing after stress. Your pup's GR gene will most likely look like this for the rest of its life. In fact, the amount of nurturing you gave to your pup will have a major impact on its adult personality. Can you lick one, or can you do one that, like, you don't lick at all? Sure. I wonder what that, like, does with humans. Like, how they pretend they're a child? No, just, like, how attentive you are to the children. It looks like you had better things to do. Since you didn't lick and groom your pup very much, its GR gene is still inactive. Your pup will have a hard time relaxing after stress. Your pup's GR gene will most likely look like this for the rest of its life. In fact, the amount of nurturing you gave to your pup will have a major impact on its adult personality. Well, the more you know. Okay, so just a cool website I thought I'd share. All right, any questions? What's a spazzing rat like? A what? Spazzing rat. I don't know. Um, okay, so the exam is not Monday. It will be pushed to Tuesday. Um, Monday I'm going to do one more lecture, uh, biotechnology. Oh, are we supposed to, like... Yeah, we'll videotape it for you. Will it be on the test? Mm-hmm. Whoa! Oh, okay. boy! Will there be questions? Oh, yeah. Questions? Right. On Monday, like questions? Uh, yeah. Multiple choice. Oh, okay. Boy. Just go for sure.